Good evening, everyone. I'm Christopher Flood the Drummer Nars, WHOI's community contributors and engagement editor, and you're watching Teens in Trauma, Managing Mental Health During COVID-19. Since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, over 500,000 Americans have died. Nearly 100,000 businesses nationwide have closed and some 22 million Americans have lost their jobs. And on top of all this, the country is struggling with the mental health crisis and therapists are struggling to meet the demand. Among those suffering are our youth. Just this month, it was reported by WebMD.com that 46% of 977 parents of teens said their child has shown new or worsening mental health conditions since the start of the pandemic. Tonight, we will hear directly from teenagers about how they're surviving the pandemic and also talk to mental health professionals who will offer tips and best practices for sustaining positive thinking and navigating trauma. Joining me as a co-host tonight is Dr. Amy Dean, WHOI's community curator for Willingboro. Dr. Dean, good evening. Good evening, Flood, and thank you. So as someone who works with young people on a daily basis, things have definitely changed for all of us. There are feelings of isolation, intense boredom, and what seems like an addiction to virtual uh, games or activities, Zoom, FaceTime, et cetera. And it's taken over many of our lives, especially our youth. I'm ecstatic tonight that we WHYY is amplifying the youth voice, and I look forward to this discussion and learning more about how we can help teens cope the pandemic. So I'd like to introduce Jaria Anderson, six, uh, 18 years old at Willingboro High School, and she's going to come to us with a poem. Jabria. Hello, everyone. C is for the confusion, the frustration that we feel, the conflicting emotions between happiness, sadness, and being numb. O is for the oppressed and the oppressors who continue to be outed, figure out who you are in the situation and what you can do to change it. V, let's talk about the violence and the victims that are on the rise. Black Lives Matter, stop Asian hate, 97% of women, it's not all men, but it's enough. I, I am in need of guidance, please. Who can I talk to? Who can I turn to with these overwhelming feelings? D, drowning. Why do I feel like I'm drowning in schoolwork, in responsibilities, in my own thoughts? I'm being dragged in by the currents and I have no hope of reaching the top. Thank you. Thank All you right, for that, Chris. Jabria. Uh, let's now introduce our panelists for this particular conversation. It's a teenage uh, panel. And first up, Caitlin Rodriguez is 17 years old and a sophomore at Kappa High School in Philadelphia. She is a visual artist and loves to express her feelings through art as well as documentary films. Also, a huge podcast lover. She listens to podcasts every day and created her own podcast with her best friend. Welcome, Caitlin. Hi. <laughs> Great, next we have Kevin Hernandez, 16 years old, Cataract High School in Middlesex County, New Jersey, plays six instruments fluently. Welcome, 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 Kevin. Hello, thank you for having me. And last but not least, Mr. Thomas Ford, who was born and raised in Willingboro, New Jersey, and currently attends Willingboro High School. He is 16 and in the 11th grade. Thomas enjoys working out, watching TV and nature. He works at McDonald's as one of the head crew trainers here and is interested in attending a school for business in New York, DC, or Philadelphia. He is highly involved in the School National Honor Society Student Council and the Making Vision Possible program and is ranked number three in his class. Welcome, Thomas. Hello. Dr. Dean, take the first question, if you please. Absolutely. All right, for a year, young people have been learning, remote learning from home, separated from friends, from sports, from activities, school performances. What has the pandemic been like for you? And have you found ways to be happy despite the crisis? Can we start with you, Kevin? Yes, uh, um, it's been quite mundane for me. It's been, it just consisted of like waking up, uh, then cooking myself breakfast, going to school, then finishing school, procrastinating or playing games. And then nighttime was when I got productive and I would do my schoolwork. 
and then I would go to sleep late at night. So it was it was just that on repeat for several well until now. Um, I have found a way to uh, find fun though. Um, I've been FaceTiming my friends, playing games with them as well. Awesome. All right, Doc, Caitlin. To, yes. Actually, before we move on from um, Kevin, um, can you know, you play six instruments fluently? Have you written any new music uh, during the pandemic? No, I don't write music. I only uh, search on uh, line for free for free uh, music and play that. Well, follow up. Have you gotten better at any of the six instruments that you play? Most definitely. Okay. Most definitely. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Uh, anyone else want to take that question? How have you kept yourself um, happy uh, during this period? Caitlin, you were going to say something, I believe. I wasn't sure if anyone else was going to say anything. I didn't <laughs> want to. I didn't want to like over go over anyone. But mostly for me, um, as it was mentioned, I'm an artist. So a lot of the time, I like to put all my feelings into my art. Um, so I've been making a lot of artwork during the pandemic to kind of like help my anxiety. It's a really like soothing thing for me. And sometimes I just go on nature work walks and I just like going outside and kind of sitting outside and also doing artwork to help me like combat like anxiety or fears. Awesome. Well, I guess we have to follow up when you do when, when you found yourself sad um, during the pandemic, did you share your feelings with anyone? Personally, I kind of got more quiet over the pandemic and I found that like a lot of my friends also got more quiet. I used to be like very extroverted, but then I kind of got like social anxiety and I didn't want to share as much. But the people that I tried to share to uh, were my best friends. And it was kind of like we both had the mutual understanding of that we're both going through this together. We're both going through online school like we can't see each other for how many months now and it's been tough but I try to at least talk to them here and there to kind of like have a peace of mind. Okay all right Jabria what about you? When you found yourself uh, alone? For me um well luckily I have my nephew in the house so when I'm feeling kind of down. He's always goofy. So I get to go and play with him or my dog. Um, I like to read. So I've been reading a lot. Uh, I've been writing some more monologues and posting them on my acting page. Um, the happiest moment for me, for sure, though, when I was actually getting quite low was when I auditioned for college and then I got accepted. So that has heightened my spirits by a lot and besides that now I'm making jewelry so I'm just trying to find things to keep myself distracted and keep my hopes up high. Congratulations um, Jabria I want a follow-up question before we go to um, Mr. Ford on the same question what mood were you in when you wrote that poem that you shared with us what was the um, inspiration for that? Um, honestly I was just thinking about all the things that continue to happen um, I absolutely thought about the whole trauma aspect of this conversation and thinking about everybody has their own different trauma experience, whether it's with violence, um, emotional, just different types of things that um, some are inappropriate, so I don't want to say, but just thinking about how everyone would feel and trying to touch base on just about everything that has happened over this year that we have been in this pandemic. So do you, you would describe the emotion as, as just reflective? Yes. Thank you. Um, Mr. Ford, what about you? What's the pandemic been like for you? Um, and what have you found that has made you happy? I think in the beginning of the uh, quarantine, it was just me trying to find a schedule and something to get used to because I would just wake up, eat whenever I wanted to, do school wherever I had time. I never really had a schedule. But I think towards like when beginning the school year, I actually started to have a schedule of what to do and every, what I like to do. So one of the things I like to do is like work out a lot and go outside. So I like to go for runs and work out a lot. So I use that a way to focus and determine and to work on myself. And I should also talk to other people, like talk to my sister, friends, and just pretty much how I'm feeling at that moment, even if it's happy, sad, where I feel like you talk to somebody about it or just have, let somebody talk to you. I like to listen to. Hmm. So you you have been talking to other people about how you feel. 
yeah, more like a conversation wise, not something. It's just like, how are your day going so far? And like, yeah, today was a good day. I just did all this, or it was a bad day. I said, yeah, today wasn't the right day. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, Dr. Dean. I do have a question. I heard Jabria mentioned it. What does trauma mean to you? The word trauma, hmm. what does it mean? Well, when I think of trauma, I think something that hurts you or something that caused like bad memories or something. Okay. I saw you, Jabria, taking. Uh, for me, I would take it as something that kind of you might have a certain reaction to different things now based off something that might have happened um i know for some people they for, forget a period in time where something might have happened to them so that's also some trauma or just overall something affecting your character and your personality hmm. okay anyone else want to weigh in on that what does trauma the word trauma mean to you and if not that word, what about stress? What does the word stress mean to you? I am very familiar with this um, motion, sort of. Uh, I've been um, under stress a lot because of school and other things. So I feel like stress is like you're being very overwhelmed about events that are happening in your, happening in your life and you don't know how to cope with it or you haven't coped with it yet. Thank you. Uh, you know, quick follow up for Mr. Hernandez. When you talk about stress, one of the things that has come up in, in national studies are parents, um, one in four parents are reporting that their teens have had uh, negative changes to their sleep patterns. And, and as we all know, stress can impact sleep. You know, have you noticed a, a difference in, in the way you sleep uh, since the beginning of the pandemic? Yes, most definitely. Um, so. I was quite surprised at this comparison too. Um, back when I was a sophomore, I'm a junior now, um, and we didn't, we weren't in the pandemic. I would go to sleep at like I don't know eight and wake up at six, fully, fully um, rested. But now sometimes I go to sleep at like 12, 1 a.m. and wake up at eight, and I'm very tired. Sometimes I go over um, eight o'clock, and I'm a little late for school as a result of that. So I. The pandemic has really affected my um, my sleeping schedule, unfortunately. And you're late for school, even even though it's remote, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I used to joke at the beginning of the pandemic to shout out to everybody who's late to who's late to work, even when you're working from home. <laughs> you know, you don't have the commute and everything like that. I, I, you know, when you find yourself uh, asleep, or, or I should say, awake at a, at a time you usually sleep. What are you doing to occupy your time? Is it, is it just that you're in your head and you're kind of thinking about things? Or are you reading, just scrolling social media till you get bored? How do you occupy that time that would used to be reserved for sleep? Uh, so um, I found out that I found out that I have a really big passion for gaming. So I've reached out to a couple of my friends and my cousin. Sometimes um, we we go overboard with the gaming. Um, and that's really what occupies my time, just playing games um, often. And that's a sweet gamer chair that you have there. Isn't that a gamer chair? <laughs> yeah, I got it for my birthday. Very, very nice. Uh, anybody else? Um, Ms. Rodriguez, um, what about you? Um, I don't really know what stress means to me, but for me, I view stress as like, it's it's taken over my life most of the time now i'm always on zoom or like google me my eyes are always tired i have contacts now because mm. i need to get them because like the like glasses are just too much for me at this point so for me i view like stress as kind of like this barrier that i have to like kind of get over um or that i try to work to get over this is a question for um uh mr ford and mr hernandez um when you think about some representations of masculinity and and boyhood or, or manhood, depending on how you view yourself at this moment, it's the suggestions are about being tough and not sharing your feelings Has these social ideas at all made it harder for you to share uh, the things that you're going through. And if not, have you noticed that it's made it hard for boys your age that you're friends with to talk about how they're feeling? Um, Mr. Ford, you first and then um, Mr. Hernandez. Uh, for me personally, I don't think it had been hard for me expressing my feelings because I think a lot of times when people talk about feelings, they 
necessarily mean it in a negative way, never in a positive way. So sometimes we could say you have uh, emotions, you could say you was happy or it was an okay day. Sometimes I think when people say expression emotion, they think it could be to the extreme limit. So I think sometimes just listening and talking to somebody may help them express their feelings in a certain way. I said, especially for people, other people I learned, if you just talk to, especially guys my age, like just listen to them and just talking to regular conversation, it don't have to be necessarily about something that's stressing them or stressing or what stressing people. Because now I think just talking to them, just a regular conversation, just get their mind away from it, the way kind of them to express themselves a little bit, express like their emotions personally. Thank you for that. You know, I, I think what you said was profound and doc, I'd like to get you and, and some of even the other teens to weigh in on. Because I have found that when they say, well, share how you're feeling or, or do you ever share what your emotions, it is oftentimes been a negative context, right? But I think young people share all the time that, hey, I'm happy. You know, I, I just got accepted into college. You know, I just had my first kiss. You know, uh, you know, they gave me extra fries in my McDonald's bag and they didn't charge me. I mean, it's like <laughs> all kinds of things that happen throughout the day that are joyous. And I think people do share those. Um, and I, I just thought that that was a really profound point, Mr. Ford, that, you know, when, when we talk about sharing feelings and thoughts, it is often framed as negative. And, and I don't know how we how we fix that and why we even do that in the first place. That's anybody you want to respond to that. I mean, I, that just resonated with me. I don't know if it resonated with anyone else the way the way it did with me, but feel free to weigh in. Can I add one more thing to that? Yes, please. I said also I feel as teens. They have a certain person for me personally. A lot of times, like I'm not really a person to smile a lot. So a lot of mm -hmm. times, my face expression looks serious or I look annoyed. But a lot of times, I'm not annoyed. Just my face expression. So a lot of times, I think people just assume things based on face expression or they're angry or they're just a teenager. But sometimes my face expression may be serious. But this is me like join where I may not talk a lot. But sometimes you don't have to be like physical and do all the talking. Everything just being there could be. A good presence or you you just being there at a bit you don't necessarily show so much uh okay i think you could be emotional but like i think emotions come in different ways mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i agree I, I get um i get accused dr dean as, as people think i'm a mean person because I, I rarely smile on my pictures and and i'm like I, you know me i'm a very happy-go-lucky guy absolutely <laughs> absolutely um, Javria, you just got a, a message in the chat, in the audience chat, asking where they can get the, the words to your moving poem. Um, and a question that I guess we'll pose to the teens, and I know we'll hear about it from the mental health professionals, but how would you recommend helping someone your age, a peer, who doesn't want to socialize? How would you recommend they connect with other people? And would you? I know we're going to ask the professionals, but what about you? Peer to peer, how do you recommend we connect or teens connect? Um, for me, connecting, because um, I know that there are some introverts out there, I've seen a lot of people that are actually on this, I think it's a site and it's called Discord. And some people just, they go on there for gaming or um, there's like sites when you can you can watch movies with people. There's just a, with many ways that are coming out where you can connect, connect with other people. Um, even some sites where you can just like text people and you talk, of course you want to be safe about it, but just doing things that way, or even um, social media, TikTok, and like talking to people in the comments, I always find that really fun, like interacting with people that make videos, especially like um, smaller social media people. Those are always really good ways to connect with people that I think work well, or just finding people that are interested in the same things you are, fandoms, anything of that nature. Okay. Did anyone else want to weigh in? Because uh, she mentioned the word safe, and I'd like to to talk about one of the other emotions experienced. Anyone? Uh, yeah, I'd like to weigh in. Oh, sorry. So um, I think that social media is a very like important, or at least the internet is a very important way to try and get yourself connected to the, uh, each other, because it's a is a very slow way of getting to know another person, and it's not too upfront, so you don't have to deal with that anxiety of meeting a new person and talking to them and trying to find. Um, new conversation topics. So yeah, I agree with her. Like social media, you know, Discord is a very good way of um, trying to meet new people and make new friends. Interesting. Oh, like on that quick thing before you move to the next piece, Doc, um, and I'd like to lead with this question with Miss um, Rodriguez, if you don't mind. Um, you know, <laughs> I think one of the things that is is um, 
uh, uniquely uh, germane, well, maybe not uniquely germane, but but germane certainly to teenage life is always on social media, right? Um, always looking at your phone, always on the internet, you know, TikTok, Instagram. But if, I found also in this time, and you kind of alluded to it, that it, 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 it can be a little bit much now that it's kind of no other option, right? You know, prior to the pandemic, social media was considered a luxury and now it's a necessity. And I'm wondering, does that, does that switch in context now cause it to be a burden sometimes where you're, you're feeling Zoom fatigue or you're, you know, you, you feel like you have to interact because you can't be around people. So has it put pressure on you at this point to interact with social media and other types of um, video conferencing platforms when you don't want to? Um, short answer, yes. <laughs> you can so, give me a long answer too. <laughs> for me, um, I, even before the pandemic, I loved, loved being on my phone all the time. Um, I was always on Instagram, TikTok, all of that. I think, well, musically before TikTok came out um, and I was always on my phone. But now I find it so hard to just text people. Like I can't get through anything nowadays. It's very hard on my eyes just being on like on screen 24 seven and being on screen on my phone 24 seven trying to um, communicate with all of my friends trying to keep up with their lives because like I you don't realize the conversations that you miss when you're like in school or just passing by in the hallways and you don't realize like how much you're getting through that. And when I came, when it came to the pandemic and when it came to trying to communicate to the 15 billion people that I was trying to communicate with in school, it became burdensome and it became like, oh, I'm trying to communicate to like 20 different people at once. And it's too much for me. I can't respond to all of them. So now it limits to like one or two people per day. Yeah, that's real. Thank you for that. Dr. Dean? So fear. Another emotion that um, has been talked about a lot during the pandemic. Have you experienced COVID related fear? You know, they say young people are feel like they're invincible, you know, stereotypes. Right. But have you felt or can you relate to COVID related fear and how have you managed it? What do you do? Can I answer that? Um, for me, I have asthma. <laughs> so COVID has become like this thing where it's like, I really do not want to get that because just normally I have a low immune system and asthma. And with that, just a simple cold is a lot for me. I'm already out for like two weeks coughing and dying on the bed. <laughs> so like it, I got scared of going outside sometimes. And I certainly did not want to like affect my parents or my um, grandfather who lived with me for some time. And I, don't, I try to get over that, but sometimes I find it hard to like just socialize in general. Okay. Anyone else want to talk about that? COVID related fear? Go ahead, Kevin. So um, my best friend had COVID and he and he was like the, the thread that I was hanging on. He and I uh, were communicating almost every day. We were having a lot of fun. And I was quite worried that something might happen to him, that he might go into critical condition or, you know, the things that you usually see in the news about COVID-19. So um, I guess I just to ensure myself that he was still there and he was still healthy, I would text him every day and ask him how he was feeling. Good stuff. Jabri, would you like to add, weigh in on that? Uh, my fear wasn't necessarily for me, but more so for my parents, because I know that my mother, she works with kids and they say that kids aren't really a carrier, but some of them can be, especially when we know that kids get sick a lot when they're young and she works with toddlers. And my fear was just that one day she would be sick and she wouldn't know, or a coworker might get sick. and having to constantly go to get tested just to make sure she's all right. I love, um, as well as my father, um, he works with a lot of people and just them getting sick and he, him being there, it caused like fear in the family and it caused a lot of stress and confusion in the house where it got to the point that we weren't, we weren't more so a family. It felt like a war zone when everybody was getting worried about it. But other than that, I've, I've been okay. Okay. I have a, yeah, I have a quick, quick question. Um, 
Let's start with um, Mr. Ford and, and then uh, open it up to anybody who wants to take it. I, I'm curious as to how did the adults in your life, uh, such as your parents and teachers, explain what the pandemic was and how, would, how it would impact your life? I, what did that conversation sound like? Give us some insight. I think uh, at first in the beginning of quarantine, I feel like we already knew was, like, as teenagers what was, uh, quarantine was and what COVID was. I feel like a lot of times in the beginning of quarantine, a lot of people suspected like, teens, they didn't know what it was. We just came through the pandemic. But I don't think people realize how many times like we're living in just as part as adults. So a lot of times they may just look at it oh, as a teenager. He's just thinking a teacher. It's still a child. But I think as teenagers, a lot of times adults don't look at us as young adults. So I think it's harder for them to think to see a perspective. So when I had a conversation with my parents about court, uh, quarantine about COVID and it's like during the peak around this time last year like in March and April and it was like you can't be going outside the house like that and pretty much because this when all the COVID cases start coming so I wasn't worried but I agree because like to the point it was like yeah it's quarantine you stay in the house two weeks I think it's got harder later on after I think June you know, the summertime started coming and it's like all right we've been in the house nearly three months and it's like been just standing here every single day nothing to do all the stores closed I think that's when we actually have a, a conversation. And also, I think that at that point, that when everybody in my house, we were all living with each other. So I think it was like what Jabria said, we're kind of like a war zone within adults, not adults, within everybody in the house, because we have been uh, all within the house for so long. I think we all was kind of dealing with different emotions. I think that was key within, not only just teenhood, within adulthood. So I think with adults, teen, just all actually emotions. So I think at the quarantine, actually, kind of taught us how to deal with emotions and how to deal with each other. So I think that was the most important thing. Thank you for that. Anyone else want to give us an insight onto how your parents talked to you about the pandemic and the restrictions and the mask wearing, which was certainly um, new for me. What was that conversation like in your household, Ms. Rodriguez? Um, for me, my parents just wanted to make sure that out of everything, I was safe out of um, just making sure every time I went out with friends, always wear a mask. Every time I went out, always have hand sanitizer. Um, my mom, every time I went out, she checked my bag. She put in the mask, she put in the hand sanitizer, she put in the wipes. And she was just very like safe forward. Uh, it, it, it was hard um, trying to communicate, trying to come to a mutual understanding because they have a different life than what from I have. And it was trying to come to understand like, okay, I'm going through this you're going through this, um, how can we kind of have this like level head? How can we understand each other and understand um, each other's like struggles as a teenager, as an adult? And it was an ongoing conversation for a while, but um, it, it became like, we kind of got a level head at the end of the day. And we kind of understand each other. Like I understand my mom better now, seeing her struggles, seeing her, um, from losing her job for a little bit, then going back because a lot of adults became unemployed due to COVID. And then they finally got their job back. And then seeing her struggle with me, um, trying to understand my anxiety or my fears, or when I was depressed and I didn't want to get out of bed and trying to give me the love and affection that she needed to as a mother. Thank you for that. Um, anyone else want to give us insight? Uh, for me, it was between my older sister, my mother, and I. Uh, my older sister and I always wanted to at least go outside, like go for a drive, go for a walk somewhere. And my mom was not having it. <laughs> she did not want it to happen at all. But eventually we came to like this mutual understanding. And I started being allowed to go outside more as long as I was safe and I was allowed to be around people that I had been around when the COVID had first hit us um, and just making sure that of course we social distance and that they were safe. So as long as my friends were tested and we knew what they were doing, then I was okay and I was allowed to go out. But she still was kind of weary about it. Um, but now we're doing much better. She's okay with us going out. We go out sometimes together, go to the park. So I'm just glad that it got from being here to being here and now everything is just leveled out and we're fine. And Mr. Hernandez. 
So I just remember this one specific event in which I, I was very um, upset by what my parents had said. Uh, I was I wanted to go to one of my friend's birthday parties. And this is when COVID was um, not necessarily like dying out, but the cases were uh, slowing a little bit. So I didn't understand why they wouldn't let me go, um, especially because we would all be social distanced and um, we would have masks and we were outside most of all. So I I didn't understand their fears, but uh, when the party came near or when the date of the party came near, um, my parents talked it out with me and told me why they felt the way they did. And I we did uh, reach a level of understanding, but at the end of the day, they let me go. So I was very happy that we had this conversation. Thank you. Dr. D, last question of this segment. Sure. So adults are worried about young people, right? And should be because you've experienced a lot during the pandemic as well. Based on your life and perhaps conversations with your friends, what are signs of trouble that we should know, that adults should know? Or excuse me, what are signs of trouble that adults don't know, mm -hmm. you know, or would not know? Yes, go ahead, Kevin. So I feel like this is a really big and it goes unnoticed a lot or it gets misinterpreted um, is when students feel really discouraged to do their schoolwork or to go above and beyond and make themselves a really good student for college. Um, I remember there was a time in which like I was I was feeling discouraged, especially with all the AP classes and honors classes I had. And I didn't feel like doing my work because I didn't understand it. Um, and my parents kind of mistook that as me being lazy. Um, so I, I just had to power through it. And I feel like adults now, um, sometimes they invalidate uh, the um, children's feelings and they think, oh, you're just being lazy. And instead they're actually discouraged and they don't feel like doing their work because they don't understand it. Good one. Thank you, Kevin. Anyone else want to share things that we don't know? Yes, go ahead, Thomas. I think personally for my experience, like at first, even still now, I learned how to cope with it now. But at one point in quarantine, you know, a lot of times people said yeah, unmotivated. I think I was literally putting too much pressure on myself. And I still do it still now. Like at one point, I was still doing my AP classes, honors, I was working 40 hours at my job a week, then I was doing honor society, uh, community service, working out, and I still feel like I was not doing enough for the day. My parents look at me and say, it's like, he don't know how to sit still, but that's just me. Like, I feel like I have so much things I have accomplished that I still have yet accomplished. So I think they look at it as like, oh, he's trying to do too much at once, or he's just trying to hurry up. But I think it's just a way to deal with things. I feel like keeping your mind busy. I think that was for me. I always try and do different things to keep your mind busy. Also, I think what people say, like, you look at, me like said, being discouraged a lot of times because I feel like you look on other people doing certain things that like you want to do just as much as other people. So you put too much on your plate at once. That way, especially for me, I know I put way too much on my plate sometimes. Some things I can't handle, I can't handle, but sometimes I learn to take a day off or break off just to relax your mind. Thank you. Jabria, anything that we don't know that we should? Signs of uh, trouble that we can't understand. I feel like along with uh, the laziness, as Kevin was saying, that being in your room, locking yourself in your room, um, the, the eating schedule that you're on, staying in bed, watching TV, just if you look and you really think that like, you think about it, it's not laziness. It's more of I don't feel like not I don't feel like, but I just it's sort of leading into depression. And I feel like not a lot of adults acknowledge that they more so think of it as lazy, especially the older generations because they were constantly doing things and they were being productive, but it's gotten to this point. We have been in this pandemic for over a year. We have been on online school for over a year. So everything is just so overwhelming for us. And I feel like that's a sign that not a, a lot of adults look at. So I know for me, I locked myself in my room all the time, but I had to break myself out of it. And it was looked at as me being lazy or me not wanting to interact. And I didn't want to interact at times, but I just, I still needed somebody to come and talk to me. So that's why I'm glad I have my sister. She understood. Caitlin, did you want to weigh in? I was going to say, realizing that we need our mental health days too. Um, cause sometimes it's hard 
to get up. Sometimes it's hard to just eat breakfast or sometimes it's hard to just get on, on class. Um, and I just feel like that needs to be better understood that sometimes I just can't, I'm just not motivated to do that. So just understanding that with us. Thank, Thank you. you for that. Uh, Jabri Anderson, Caitlin Rodriguez, Kevin Hernandez, and Thomas Ford. Uh, they'll be joining us um, later in the program for a full town hall conversation. But in the meantime, thank you so much. Um, we're gonna introduce a video package that features more teen voices as well as a resource guide. And when we come back, we'll be talking with mental health professionals. started realizing like, whoa, this is not gonna end anytime soon. Um, whenever I started thinking that, that's when everything kind of went downhill, my mental health went down. I didn't even know what my purpose was. I just felt like I was just sitting at home all day doing work. And honestly, I came to a point in time where I, um, my academics were a lot lower. And then instantly I had to find myself trying to find new hobbies and ways to distract myself so that I won't overthink anything because I tend to overthink a lot and sometimes I can start a deep depression. We can't just forget about everything else. Yeah, like Black Lives Matter. Well, what about socialization? Hello, the interaction. What about mental health? Depression is real. COVID has triggered so many feelings of hopelessness and being alone is not helping that at all. Good evening again. You're watching Teens in Trauma, Managing Mental Health During COVID-19, a community conversation presented by WHYY and made possible by the Scattered Good Foundation. I'm Christopher Flood, the German Nars, WHYY's community contributors and engagement editor. And joining me as a co-host this evening is Dr. Amy Dean, WHYY's community curator for Willingboro. Dr. Dean, let's introduce the panelists for our next set of conversations. Awesome. I have the pleasure of introducing Mr. Gary Nelson, who holds a master's in counseling, is a nationally certified counselor and a New Jersey Board of Professional Counselors licensed professional counselor. Certification in post-traumatic stress management and trauma, years of clinical training and supervision in context-centered family systems therapy, working with adolescents, PTSD, anxiety. He has over 11 years of experience creating, managing, and participating in youth development programs and initiatives. Welcome, Mr. Gary Nelson. And Dr. Camilla Jackson is a double board certified child, adolescent and adult psychiatrist who serves as a medical director at AmeriHealth Caritas and was recently interviewed by the Washington Post for an article titled, Why It's So Hard to Identify Seasonal Depression in Kids and How to Help. She's available to answer the questions you might have that will help your listeners know how to best help children navigate the pandemic until the vaccine is available to all. Dr. Jackson, welcome. Thank you. I have Dr. Shairi Turner, Chief Transformation Officer for the Crisis Text Line, a not-for-profit volunteer-supported organization that delivers crisis interventions using a text platform. Stanford graduate and a Harvard-trained internist and pediatrician with a Master of Public Health from the Harvard School of Public Health. Welcome, Dr. Turner. Thank you so much. Thank you all for joining us today. I, I guess we'll start with just an opportunity for you all to react to what you heard from our first panel. Was there anything in the prior conversation from the teenagers that stood out to you or that you'd like to respond to? Uh, Dr. Jackson, you first. Sure, well, first I'll just say it's a really tough act to follow, the teenager, <laughs> the poem, and especially the discussion. Um, they really hit on every highlight um, that we deal with as, as child and adolescent psychiatrists um, going through the pandemic. and. The responses were so insightful, thoughtful, um, the ways that they're coping, so important. Uh, they really just talked about every dynamic that I think we're gonna cover, only probably not as well as they did, I have to say, <laughs> to the, my, my peers on the panel. Um, and uh, Daria, your uh, poem was 
Beautiful, very um, concise, but so to the point about your experiences. And I think really just highlights a lot of what I hear um, from, from teenagers during this time. So um, great job, all of you. Mr. Nelson. Yes, uh, so thank you to the students that, uh, this, to, that uh, let us in with this topic. Um, what I heard was a lot of resilience. Um, I heard a lot of being able to recalibrate how the pandemic affected them just as much as it affected us. And what they did is they decided to make it work for them. So whether that is reorganizing how they approach school, where, whether it's reorganizing the time that they did their schoolwork, um, implementing new things into their lives, working out, um, changes in eating and things like that. I heard that it was hard for you at the beginning and it is still hard for you now, but now you're taking an active approach to your own mental health and you're finding ways to actually make it work for you. And, and it sounds like you're also challenging the adults in your life too, to, to let them know, listen, we're in the same boat as you. We feel the same things that you feel. It may be in different areas, but we, we re we're relating to the same thing. So um, I just tip my hat to the students and, and thank you. That was a learning experience for me. Dr. Turner. Yes, yeah, so wise. You all are so um, self-aware and reflective. I'm, I'm proud of you for just being here and sharing with other teenagers your experiences, the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? And to be able to say that, you know, this is what we took, this is, this is how we handled a situation that was unexpected, unseen, unplanned for, and we're still here and we're still doing our thing, it's not easy, right? And we're not gonna pretend that it is. And I just appreciate each of you for your, your candor and, and your willingness to share that with other teens and be vulnerable in that way. So thank you. I appreciate all your responses. Like, I guess, you know, just my initial reaction to, to what you all are saying, this is not necessarily a question that was planned, but I, I think you all are very much capable of answering this. Um, having those young people do what they just did and, and and kind of just talk with each other and 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 express feelings both good and bad is that something we should both normalize and as a community and as media intentionally create space for because typically when we do panels like this it is always the the academics the professionals the adult the adults the thought leaders and we kind of talk to youth and about youth but never with youth and do you feel like a platform like what you just saw is something we should normalize? That's open for anybody. I would say absolutely. I think Thomas really um, said it so well in terms of feelings. Um, as a society, we don't actually, we don't talk about feelings. There's so much stigma about mental health, any type of mental health concern. Um, and I really think our teenagers are leading the way for us in terms of just being more intact with their emotional life uh, than a lot of the adults in their lives are. And not being afraid of confronting feelings, talking about feelings, as scary as they may, might be at times. Um, I think they're really modeling the way for us um, as, as adults as well um, to move forward. So it's just, it's just not something that we take seriously enough at times. You know, we have a, a great vocabulary for physical health symptoms, um, but, for some reason, we continue to see the emotional life and the mind is disconnected from the rest of the body and our social discourse really reinforces that. Um, and so I think what Thomas said was brilliant, um, especially for an adolescent boy to be sharing those, um, those feelings as well, because there's a real gender effect as well in terms of girls talk about feelings, teenage girls talk about feelings, but teenage boys don't. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, just a quick follow up, Dr. Jackson, what, you know, speaking of Mr. Ford, I, I, you know, as I said in the other panel, what I found profound about what he talked about was that feelings are always kind of, you know, um, contextualized as, as bad. And they don't necessarily talk about joyous feelings. And I know that teen boys talk about feelings all the time, right? Like, I'm hype, yo, I'm about to go. Like, I feel good, like I'm pumped. Like, th those are also expressing feelings. And I don't know why we don't credit that the joy in expressing and sharing joy as part of sharing feelings. I think it's because of our limited vocabulary around just how how we internalize things, um, our internal lives. We don't really bring that out often. And I see, I think both sides of that, right? Both the positive sides 
um, as well as the negative sides uh, as well. I think one of the things as mental health experts that uh, is a real opportunity with just how all of us are reacting with the pandemic, right? I think for the first time, there are people who may not have had emotional challenges before, who because of the social isolation through the pandemic are really connecting uh, to different ways of feeling that maybe they ever considered of other people. And so it's really, like you said, Chris, normalizing um, a lot of issues that were not normal to talk about before the COVID pandemic. Thank you for that. Anyone else wanna weigh in? I was just going to ask Dr. Jackson, how do you frame that conversation without making young people feel uncomfortable? Mm -hmm. Like, how would you recommend that adults frame that conversation? Because it needs to be had. Yeah. But sometimes adults are uncomfortable. Right. Uh, and I think um, a lot of the teens spoke about this as well in terms of the interaction with their parents. And I have some questions about that advice that you <laughs> might give us uh, working with adults as well. Um, but I think the more that parents can just be honest about their reactions, you know, um, I think it was Caitlin spoke about her mom losing her job. I'm sure she had a lot of feelings about that. So even sharing how she was feeling and, and not being afraid of sharing that with you, sharing that vulnerability with you, kind of modeling the way for you to be able to share back with her how you're feeling as well. Um, I think as adults, we feel like we have to be strong for our kids. Um, the fact of the matter is they're looking at us, whether they're little kids or teenagers, they're really taking your, their cues and paying attention to how we're responding to things. So the more we can be honest about how we're feeling and how we're coping or how we plan to cope with the feelings that we're having, the more we can connect with them and, and try to model the way for them and create open space and dialogue to talk with them as well. Thank you. Um, you know, Dr. Turner, Councilor Nelson, I want to give you guys a chance to weigh in. Yes, I, I well, I would also echo um, what was just said. I think one of the biggest tools that we have, uh, not just for me as a clinician, but also as a parent, is um, empathy. And I think that is one of the the major areas that we as parents need to nurture because I think uh, we should all by now look at the word just as a curse word by now because when we're working with uh, when, when we're talking with our kids and they're telling us about the things that they're going through, a lot of times we can look at that and say, I went through that as a kid. They're not worrying, they don't need to worry about half the things that I need to worry about right now. All you need to do is just this and you'll be okay. Instead of really just taking the time to sit with them and putting ourselves in their shoes, what could it possibly feel like to be a teenager that is losing their senior experience because of a pandemic? What is it like being separated from all of your friends? What is it like having to look at your friends on a computer screen? What type of social anxiety does that develop when it looks like all eyes are on you? <laughs> and now as a result, I heard Caitlin mention before about be, uh, beginning to turn inward and begin, uh, begin to isolate more. Uh, and so all of these things can, can lead to to uh, different feelings and emotions for us. And when we have the, when we're looking in front of the computer screen at 20 other people staring at us, I can understand, I can feel that. I can understand why anxiety would develop. I can understand why I would begin talking to a, a lot less people, why I would start to look at everybody's facial expression. Like I might even start doing now, looking at everyone's facial expression on the panel and start to look at and think about how are they judging me or what are they thinking about me as I'm talking. So being able to listen to what my child is saying, to what a student is saying, and to do my best to just listen and understand and reflect back what I'm hearing from them, I think that's one of the biggest tools that we can have in our arsenal right now. I would, I would just add Thomas, Kevin, Caitlin, Jabriah, we have no clue. We have no clue what your experience is because we have not been through it. This is 117th and 118th of your lives, right? And for us, it's such a smaller sliver that we're five seconds ahead of you in anticipating and predicting and trying to help you all um, to, to get through this because it's just as new to us. We have, we have years more context, but we have no clue how it is for you. We are, we are guessing and we're using our expertise, but understand that we're doing the best we can to help you all in this situation. Same thing with your parents, right? So. When you tell us what you feel, 
right? We as adults have to listen because we don't understand the magnitude of what it's like to lose a senior year. We are watching, we are empathizing, but we have no clue. <laughs> Thank you for that. Dr. Jackson, if I can, quick follow up, you know, and, and you know, Dr. Jackson, you can answer, but this is certainly open to everyone else to respond. Um, when, you're, when you're listening, is it appropriate to tell a young person who is in crisis that everything will be okay? Or could those types of platitudes and cliches cause more anxiety or more damage? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think uh, one of the prior panelists spoke to this well. So one is I want to sort of understand where that comes from. And I think as parents, you want to protect your kids, right? Um, and so if you get a sense that um, something scary is happening with them, you want to save them. You want to rush in protect them from whatever bad is happening. Um, but as we heard before, very clearly, um, you sort of shutting down conversation before it starts can feel very invalidating. And I think as adults, we experience that as well. If you say, oh, I have a bad day, and someone says, oh, I had a terrible day, um, you know, they start with that, it, it shuts you down. You don't want to open up anymore. Um, and so I think what Dr. Turner uh, shared uh, earlier as adults, um, you know, it's, probably no secret to you all, but we don't know what you're experiencing right now. Um, but your parents, they want to connect and understand that. And I think they struggle with how to approach that conversation with you um, in a way that um, will connect with you. Um, and so I think the more we can say, we don't understand, but we want to, um, you know, um, we want you to let us in uh, to your lives and, and share with us how you're feeling and see if there's any way that we can help you, maybe we can't. I think teenagers often think that their parents can never help them, right? <laughs> um, because they don't understand. Um, but we really want to connect in. And the best way to do that is to really create an open space and not say that you know all um, or that, you know, this is what happened when I was a teen. Because as Dr. Turner said earlier, we don't actually know. I've never lived through a pandemic um, with all the disruptions to life, with social media, the way that you guys are connecting virtually. I mean, we're learning from you all um, as we go along. So really creating that open space um, to say, I don't know, but I really want to know. Can you can you open up to me? Thank you for that. Dr. Turner, Councilor Nelson, did you want to weigh in on that particular conversation point? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. I was, could you repeat the question really quick? I sure. I, I, this following is, Dr. Jackson. Uh, no problem. This is for uh, both Councilor Nelson and Dr. Turner, if you want to weigh in. Just as, as you're listening, you know, listening to children as, as you encouraged us to, to do, uh, and, and also acknowledging that adults don't necessarily know what these young folks are going through, is it appropriate to just say everything is going to be okay? Or would those types of platitudes and, and cliches cause more anxiety and could be perceived maybe as dismissive? Yeah, I think when, when we first acknowledge that, that this is a new experience for everyone, um, we have to then open the door and allow um, young people to speak their truth, right? If we close, if we say, you know, if we dismiss their feelings, you do that one time with a young person and they may not ever come back to you to share because they feel like, you know, as, as an adult, we have enough of an age gap that it's hard for them to believe, um, hard for you all to believe that we could understand any part of your world. But then when you do take that step out and say, like, let me share a little piece of my world with you, and someone doesn't believe it wholeheartedly or listen fully, put down their phone and listen fully, right? Does it make you want to come back and share again? Not always. So it's, it's really important for us as adults in those moments to put down the phone, to, to sit down, to, to go face to face, eye to eye, and really listen to your teenager because it's, it could be a once, it could be a one time opportunity. Thank you for that. Councilor Nelson. I, I would definitely agree with that. Um, I, I, I do believe that it's the context in which we say it. So if we are, if we are being dismissive in saying, okay, everything's going to be okay, just don't worry about it. And it's, we don't have any background information on what exactly they're thinking, feeling, and, and doing, then that's just a very dismissive statement. And I don't believe that that should belong in our vocabulary. But I, I believe as, as parents that we should automatically 
have that gene in us that we we want to save our kids. We want our kids to be okay. So if we are listening to what they're saying and putting ourselves in their in their shoes and saying, okay, it's going to be okay, I would more so want them to have the understanding that I'm saying it's going to be okay because I'm walking alongside you in it. Mm-hmm. Not so much that mm-hmm. the situation, but that you have help, you have somebody that's there with you, and we're going to go through this together. Thank you for that. Dr. D. I was going to ask, we know that it's possible that teens or young people can uh, internalize what's happening with their parents, you know, any anxiety, any stress like that. What do you recommend to parents to better manage, you know, their emotions so that it won't stress out the teen or the young people? Dr. Turner, uh, I see. Oh, yes, Mr. I was trying. Um, um, go ahead, Dr. Turner. I'll, oh, I'll try yes, I was just going to, you know, stress management is, is the key to life, right? <laughs> we live in, just prior to the pandemic, a very stressful, with our work environment, with social media, with just parenting. Um, so it's, it's important. The key tenets of stress management are sometimes very basic, sleep, right? Eating good foods, trying to exercise, being mindful, taking deep breaths, meditating. You know, stress management is really very personal. It's, it's finding what that thing is for you that de-stresses you. Um, but in the context of being a parent and being with teenagers, it's important to recognize when you are stressed because you can't always keep the stress to a minimum. So it's equally as important for your teenagers, um, for you all, to see how a parent effectively handles stress. So to say to your child, to say to a teenager, I'm, I'm really feeling stressed today, and this is what I'm going to do to try to handle it and, and not necessarily be reactive towards you. And that might mean I'm going to go take 15 minutes and of quiet time for myself to regroup. Right. But but thinking that we're going to live in a stress free free world and and the stress free environment is is idealistic. I think we can do things to minimize. But the key is to teach our children because they are watching us, um, as as Dr. Jackson said, uh, they're watching us and they're they're learning how to manage their stress. And if they see us suppress it and stuff it, then then that is what they will internalize and, and do in the future. And that's that's not healthy. Thank you for Thank that. Thank you, Mr. I, Nelson. Yes, I, I would definitely agree. Um, self-care is is vitally important for, for all of us. Um, I, I would also say that um, I, I think subjecting ourselves to unnecessary stress too. So that can that includes watching the news. You know, we don't need to watch the news 24 hours a day. We can watch it for 15 minutes and understand what they're going to talk about for the rest of the day, pretty much. Um, I think also, I, and this is one one way that I think as adults, we may have kind of fallen short in this area is that when the pandemic hit, I think out of fear, in some ways, we became as the children. So we began looking toward the government just tell us what to do tell this is tell us this is going to be okay tell us how we need to proceed from here instead of uh educating ourselves um doing what uh following cdc guidelines uh reading peer reviewed journals educating ourselves on what what does this mean for us what is the outlook instead of focusing a lot on like opinion based media and things like that so i, I think and this is something i i really learned with with my kids is that I need to, I'm ultimately I'm their parent. So the decisions I make are going to affect them. So I need to be as knowledgeable as I can about the things that are in my control and the things that are not in my control. I need to have an understanding of how this may potentially impact them. So that way I can make the best informed decision for them. And so that may include, uh, I I believe one of, uh, I think it was Caitlin that mentioned that students need a mental health day too. That involves me looking at my my kids and see how they're reacting to being online in front of a computer all day and maybe just say, all right, you're not going to school today. I'll let your teacher know. I'll let the school know. But I need to pay attention and be in tune with what's going on with you in order for me to be the best parent that I can be for you. 
I think the only thing if I could add is um, besides our own routines for ourselves is creating family routines as well um, to manage stress. So um, someone talked about nature walks, for example, going on a nature walk with your child, right? Sometimes they're not going to sit down and talk to you, but maybe if you're walking somewhere, you're taking a bike ride together, things might come up, making a meal together, reaching out to family members together. I think the more we can create those kind of healthy routines as a family, um, that also helps model uh, for, for, for you guys all on the pa previous panel, how to do that as well and take that into the future. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, I, you kind of just alluded to, to this question, um, Dr. Uh, Jackson that we just got in the uh, the chat and and by the way uh, Councilor Nelson <laughs> uh, you have a fan and and Heather Sparks who says that last bit about we're walking with you is very powerful. Um, this is uh, Dawn McMillan writes the children have seen their parents being vulnerable in dealing with very stressful situations that have been life threatening especially economically. This is a huge stress, doubt, fear, and worry. Uh, that can keep them, excuse me, this is a huge stress, doubt, fear, and worry that parents can keep them safe. Can you talk a little bit about how the family goes forward? Um, and I think you spoke a little bit about that, Dr. Jackson, which is trying to create a family routine uh, around self-care and, and not necessarily individualizing it. Dr. Turner, Councilor Nelson, is there anything that you would add to how the family could move forward in this moment? I would, I would really only add just to keep the lines of communication open uh, as best you can with your, uh, with your, with the teenagers in our lives, with each other, um, being vulnerable and creating a space for vulnerability so that everybody knows it's okay to take a mental health day, that it's okay to have a bad day, um, and that we can share about it and talk about it and figure out how to rebuild from that. Um, but but I thought Dr. Jackson did a great job um, speaking on that too. I, I would also say to um, try your best to be non-judgmental with one another. Um, we we're not all going to to look at this pandemic through the same lens. So for one person in your family, they may be completely unafraid. They may you may look at them as being reckless uh, and you know, not understanding what the times that we're in, but we have to, we have to realize that we're all going to look at this differently, but we need to come to agreements as a family that, okay, I know so-and-so is a little bit more reserved. They're a little bit more afraid. So what can I do to make sure that they feel comfortable and they still know that I love them and I care for them rather than being judgmental and, and, you know, criticizing them for being fearful or criticize, or on the other hand, criticizing them for, um, not being fearful enough. Um, I, I think doing our best to remain a family and not letting us this divide us. Thank you for that. Dr. Dane, we're gonna pause here. I know you have some more questions. We'll ask them on the other side of this break. When we bring back our teenagers and have a full conversation, I know there's some questions that the teens have for our mental health experts. And I imagine that there's some questions our mental health experts have for our teenagers. We're gonna show you a quick resource page. And on the other side of that break, we'll be back. You're watching Teens in Trauma, Managing Mental Health During COVID-19. This is a conversation supported by the Scattergood Foundation and from viewers like you. Community conversations are a big part of what we do here at WHRY, and if you want to continue to support that and see that, you can become a member, and pledging is easier than you think. Just visit whyy.org slash TV12. That's whyy.org slash TV12. Pledging any amount makes you a member and your generosity is appreciated and not taken for granted. Welcome back, I'm Chris Norris, WHOI's Community Contributors and Engagement Editor. You can follow me across social media at Flood the Drummer, and it's been my honor to be with you so far this evening. And uh, joining me as my co-host uh, is Dr. Amy Dean, WHOI's Community Curator for Willingboro, and she will continue to assist me in this final portion of our evening, where we bring together our teenagers, uh, as well as our esteemed uh, panel of mental health professionals. Welcome back, everyone. So this is the full Brady Bunch. <laughs> Dr. Dean, uh, you start off, uh, if you will. 
Sure. We've heard the teens mention that uh, isolation, staying in their beds, um, not interacting, et cetera, was something that they've experienced as well. I asked the mental health professionals, I'll start with Dr. Turner. Is there a best practice for parents and guardians to determine how much space should you give your child or young adult who may be experiencing a mental health crisis? So that's a great question because it really speaks to knowing your child and recognizing where they are on the spectrum of a crisis, right? A crisis can be momentary and a crisis can be completely disabling. A crisis can be, um, you know, something that, that that's short and self-limited or a crisis can be a child that's on the brink of um, suicide. So you, you, a, a best practice on space would, would be hard to quantify because in fact, you need to be able to recognize uh, signs of deterioration in your child. You need to be tuned into changes in sleep and eating patterns and um, engagement even with friends um, through social media to know whether your child just needs some space or whether your child, your teenager actually needs you to lean in and be there and, and work through and listen to whatever the issue might be. So the best practice is really about knowing your child um, and, and, and recognizing when a crisis is serious. Thank you. Uh, to the teenagers, what do you think of her response? Dun, 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 dun. Thomas, what do you say? <laughs> yeah, I agree. Where I think her portrayal of adults and teenagers, I feel like they're always a certain way. I feel like, especially with parents, I feel like they had to talk to her child a certain way. So I feel like, for example, me working for experience, I work with like people with different ages and different groups of people. And it's funny how it's funny you would never think like me, a six year old, be a friend with somebody to all different groups and ages. So I think. As teenagers, I feel like people always look at us as a teenager. And I think that's a problem too. I think as one thing we should do, just look at people as like, all right, as a friend or as another acquaintance from each other. Like even as adult, like because adults are going through a lot during to quarantine too. So as much as much going through the teen, you could be relating the same thing. So you could say, How are you doing? How have the quarantine been going? Or a lot of times a conversation does not have to be as like a sit down conversation. It could just be as a car ride to the grocery store. It could be something as small as that. So I think necessarily making it more deep conversation. I think parents, that's a persona they always think they had to do make a deep conversation or uncomfortable conversation. But I think the conversation just comes comfortable how you made the conversation started. So you start a conversation saying on a car ride, like come to school, how was school? And they say how bad, like what happened? And just listening to the conversation. And I guess people don't love, realize when you listen they're actually expressing their feelings themselves and actually hearing what they're going through as well. So you're listening as what they're going through and they can listen to themselves, like how they can relate and kind of letting like pressure off themselves. And I think that's the key is the having pressure on yourselves. Thank you. That's a great answer. I, I, I guess that, and, 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 and very short, it ain't that deep, <laughs> you know? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, to the young, to our, to our uh, young adults, teenagers, are there any questions you have for our mental health professionals? And then we'll ask if our mental health professionals have any questions for you. Mr. Um, I think that's Mr. Hernandez. You, you said yes? Go ahead. So how do I tell the difference between a coping mechanism and an unhealthy habit? Mm. Great question. Mr. Nelson, Dr. Turner. Dr. Any of Jackson? you guys can take that. Yeah, so I, I'll, I'll start taking a stab and you guys can help me out. <laughs> um, um, you know, I think in terms of coping strategies, what I'm looking for when I'm working with with uh, someone like you, Kevin, um, is like, what's going to help you get towards where you want to go? What's something kind of positive that you can engage in? Like you mentioned playing instruments, right? Um, you know, that's a very positive activity. I can imagine it relieves st stress for you playing each of those instruments, maybe takes your mind off some of the stresses that you're going through. And so that's how I kind of really think about um, coping strategies, um, positive coping strategies. There are some others that 
um, as you mentioned, are, are negative. They really lead you away from where you want to go, um, right? Um, so I think during this time, both adults and teens have been engaging in more in substance use. Um, and that is a negative um, way of going about it just because of, of the impacts on your education, your relationships, and, and things like that. Yes, I would, uh, I would also say, um, take a look at, does it provide you, does your coping strategy that you're using, does it provide you with instant gratification or is it something that lasts a little bit longer for you? So for instance, when you get stressed, do you eat a pint of uh, ice cream? Do you eat a lot? Uh, it might make you feel better in the moment, but at the end of the month, when I realize that I put on an extra 10 pounds, I'm realizing this is not necessarily helping me in the long run. It's, it's making me feel good just for that moment. It's, um, so I, I would look at the strategies that you're using. Are they giving you any type of long-term success? Does it, um, I think uh, Dr. Jackson mentioned it also, like, is it, is it helping you forward in any other goals that you're trying to attain? That's just one thing to think about. Yes, I would just, I mean, strategy is the key word, right? So there are often things, substance use, where it's, it, it kind of numbs you and takes you out of, you know, your, your current situation temporarily. But is that a strategy? Does it help you get to anything better? Does it build any, um, any, any, any characteristics or any character in you, right? Because difficult situations, this, this was a year of a very lengthy and difficult situation, but you will, you will come up against difficult situations again in life. And hopefully this, this experience will have prepared you for that. Um, but in, in general, if your coping strategy, if all it does is really help you to avoid what is happening, then um, you're not necessarily toughening, building, building, building a tool, building a skill within yourself to, to power through, to figure out how to get through a situation as opposed to, you know, step to the side of a situation, hoping it will pass by using something to kind of, to numb yourself. But if you're, you know, we all have days where we want to lay in bed and watch TV, and if that is your way of resting, to then have the strategy to be energized afterwards, that's, you know, that's one thing. But if you're really trying to um, use something that has no benefit to you, then it, it's not really a strategy. It's not helping you to develop skills to handle difficult situations, to become resilient. It's a great qu question. Great question, Mr. Hernandez. Uh, any other of our, our young adults have a question for our mental health experts? I have a question. So um, as I mentioned before, I used to be like very extroverted and now I find myself like kind of having like social anxiety or like my social battery runs out very quickly. Um, I was wondering if you guys had any advice for like how to get myself like kind of like in that extroverted state again or how to get myself like kind of socializing again. I would, I would just want to make sure that, that we all understand the difference between introversion and extroversion, right? It's, it's about the amount of stimulation that you, you like to have in your environment, right? And, and, and it's not polarized, right? We're not all just extroverts or, or all just introverts. It's, it's a spectrum and you can swing in different directions given the circumstances. So if we think about extroversion as the amount of stimulation, with Zoom and with all that the pandemic has brought, you're, you're actually getting a lot of stimulation. It's just a different kind of stimulation. So, so do not judge yourself and say like, because I want, you know, I don't want to go from a day of school Zoom to FaceTime with my friends because I'm just, I'm tired of the screen. I'm tired of that interaction. Doesn't mean you're not um, an extrovert. It doesn't mean that you don't like your friends or you don't like that engagement, but it's, it's oftentimes the same type of engagement. Screen to screen is not person to person. So, so Caitlin, have, give yourself some grace 
and don't necessarily put yourself in the category of being suddenly socially anxious, where in fact, you're probably still just as extroverted as you were from a stimulation point of view, but your, your mind and your body are saying like, I've had enough Zoom. <laughs> I've had enough you know, of, of the Brady Bunch of seeing all these faces because that actually requires a certain amount of energy to interact in that way. And when you don't feel like doing that, you know, as a social, um, as a, as in, in a social way, that's okay. Like give yourself some grace and understand that it, it's okay to not want to socialize by FaceTime after being, you know, in school on Zoom all day. That's it. Caitlin, that's a also, I'm not sure if part of your comment was also just about like being out. Um, because I, I heard what you you shared um, often, actually. Um, and I think if we think of like summertime and what that first day of going back to school is like, you know, we had no time to really prepare for what happened in the last year, right? You went from like having your normal routine, going to school, doing all your activities outdoors, and then boom, you're home and you're virtual. Um, and so it's going to take like baby steps of really putting yourself out, maybe doing a walk or going to the grocery store, things like that, doing some activity with your friends and building back up to being out in the world in a physical way that we just have not been doing um, for the past year. So I think it's not un unusual at all what you're going through. And it's probably part of a reaction of just like abruptly being indoors for an entire year, you know? I would also, um, I have a bad habit of answering questions with questions. <laughs> so uh, when you asked that, I, I actually thought about what, where was that social anxiety coming from? So with the pandemic cost for a, a lot of us is it, it put us in a position where because we were isolated, we had to turn inward and we started thinking and examining every aspect of our, uh, of our life. So what was it? for you that came forward that started entering your mind that you were becoming self-conscious about and how was that now playing out in your interactions with friends? So I, I would actually, that would really be my question because those are things that can really be a blessing in disguise for you because now these can be things, core things that now going forward you wanna address and that'll just make, when you do, when we, you know, return to whatever our normal is, it, it'll make those interactions with your friends and with your family that much more rewarding. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. To our mental health professionals, any questions you have for our bright teenagers? So many questions for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do have one, you know, you all mentioned um, earlier, just some of the challenges interacting with your parents and having them being understanding. Um, and it sounds like for most of you, things have gotten to a point now where they're a lot better than there were before. Um, but I think as adults in your life, we often wonder how we can speed that process up earlier. <laughs> you know, is there a way that they could have uh, approached things earlier that would have maybe skipped over, you know, maybe nine months of just feeling like they didn't understand or the way they were approaching you was just not the right way? Like, what advice would you give to your parents, but also just adults in your life who care about you and want to figure out earlier on how to engage with you in a way that makes you feel their love and their support um, and less of their not understanding. Um, I'll stop there. Good question. Who wants to take that first? Um, I do. Okay. Um, <laughs> for me, I would say every parent says, oh, you can come and talk to me. But I feel like when that's being said, it's more of you tell me the problem and I'm going to tell you what to do. But that's not what we want. It's more so uh, I want you to listen to me. You can help me, of course, but more so just listen to what I'm saying and understand what I'm saying. If you want to give me some type of advice, I should have the decision of whether I want to take that advice or not. And I feel like there shouldn't be any type of anger towards the child for what they're saying, because you never know why they're doing what they're doing and why we bring it to your attention. So I feel like that's something that parents and adults 
more so the parent needs to um, think about and possibly address even with your child, because I know from experience that talking with other adults like Mr. Nelson or Miss Amy, that when they're not in the family, no matter where you are in the family, outside of it, I feel like adults have more of an open understanding and they actually listen to what you're saying. So. Kevin's, Kevin is nodding. You want to answer? <laughs> yeah, I, I just feel like um, if parents really want to help their children cope um, or at least establish that relationship, they need to um, I begin um, understanding more instead of shutting down the, the child immediately. Uh, because I've seen with some of my friends that when they talk, when they try to uh, communicate with their parents, their parents immediately shut them down, leaving them no no room for communication or for understanding. So there's that there's that um, disdain be- on both sides. Like one doesn't want to understand, and the other is upset about the other not wanting to understand. Um, there needs to be some sort of um, I would say to let the guard let your guard down on both sides or put your pride aside for a second and listen to each other and try to formulate a solution so that both sides can be happy. Great answer. Great answer. Um, Caitlin or, or Thomas, do you want to weigh in? Uh, I think we'll just piggyback of what okay. Kevin said. I think personally, I think personally, I feel like for general experiences, I feel like a lot of time talking to adults, they always got to make a, I think we try to tiptoe. For me, I'm up a type of person, so just tell me the question. So I think a lot of times adults, they're so scared to ask the question, don't know what our reaction will be. So it make it so much awkward than it has to be. And even to say a lot of times when parents shut us down, for me personally, I'm going to be up straight. If they shut me down, I don't feel like listening to you no more. I'm not going to be listening to you. I just feel like it is what it is. Since you're not going to listen to me, I'm not going to listen to you. I'm going to give you the same respect that I gave you gave to me. You that you gave to me, I give to you. So pretty much, I feel like what adults, I feel like they try to make it, like I said, more deeper than it has to be. So I feel like, I think, especially within like older adults, we don't have open discussion. I feel like it's more as knowing your place. And I feel like that's a really important within, I would say our generation right now is we really don't feel like we should have know our place. I feel like our place is where everybody else is, we're equal to everybody else. And I feel like that's the most important thing with adults for the like here, I got here at this point, this is why I know more than you. You don't know what you're talking about, but it's so many different experiences that were a lot of time during quarantine had so many deaths like, yeah, I know it's hard for you, but like, you don't know what it is, honestly. It could be hard for some people. It could be stressful for some people. You never know. That's why a lot of time when people say, oh, I understand. I feel like all you got to do is, yeah, I agree. It's really hard for you. And like pretty much listening. And I feel like with adults, there's so many times that they're trying to put their stuff in their places without them just asking because you're not going to never know until you ask a question or figure out what they really feel because you can have your own personality and I think they'll try to compare themselves to your ch- child or children but we're not the same person and I feel like that's the best part of within people that we're all different so I feel like learning from each other and getting different aspects can also help each other so within adults always asking like if I was a child now just think all right if you know your child, what do you think your child do? And you raise a child a certain way, what do you think their reaction to be instead of saying what your reaction be? Because your reaction may be totally different. That way, a lot of times they assume we do certain things and like soon our right, we may do this or I may do this because I definitely was doing that. But you never know because we're all different people. Good stuff, Thomas. <laughs> Good stuff, Chris. Uh, yeah, Miss uh, Rodriguez, did you want to weigh in before we move on? I mean, everyone pretty much said everything, but I can basically say like, we'll talk if we feel like the space is Mm -hmm. like under, it comes from a place of understanding and it comes from like a safe place. Like you'll listen to us, but yeah. (laughs) Thank you. Any other questions for our teenagers from our mental health professionals? You're mute. I've been taking notes. I have a, a... 17 year old, 16 year old and an 18 year old. And I just appreciate very much the reminder about mm. how to create that space um, where it's true. It's, it's seek to understand, don't seek to solve is what, mm. what I'm hearing you say. Mm-hmm. And Mr. Nelson, you want to say something? Yes. I did want to know. Um, I heard from, from um, the students that 
you were able to successfully recalibrate at some point in time after getting kind of used to or adjusted to the pandemic and you kind of pulled yourself back together to where you were able to get back on your schoolwork. Uh, you were able to find a way to discipline yourself to do other types of activities. I wanted to, I wanted to know what was the, what was the, the point that you got to that caused that change? Like what encouraged that change in you? I know for me, um, it became to the point where it was like a lot of negative thoughts and I didn't, I didn't sleep until like 3 a.m., 4 a.m. Um, and it just became a cycle. So for the pandemic, I just had to get to this place of self-reflection. And I think it was in the middle of the pandemic. And from there, I had all this time on my hand and I didn't want to just sit there and loathe or like be sad anymore. I just wanted to kind of reflect on like why I'm feeling sad or like why am I feeling certain negative thoughts? And that's what really like took a turn for me. That's good. Kevin, did you want to weigh in? So uh, it was similar to Caitlin, what Caitlin said. Um, I realized that this was, it was getting too far to the point where it was becoming unmanageable and unmanageable. Um, I, I rarely got sleep. And if I did, I would be sleeping through the whole entire day and I missed out on my day essentially. And I, a lot of my friends were hanging out. So I realized, well, this isn't really working for me because I miss out on hanging out with my friends and I miss out on my day as well. Um, so at that point of realization, um, I just decided that there needs to be some change. And of course that change doesn't happen immediately because uh, I think that would be sort of unhealthy. So it would be, uh, I, I did sort of like a gradual change. I would try to go to sleep earlier um, and I would try to develop more healthier habits. And I am where I am now as a result of that. That's awesome. Jabria. Uh, for me, there have been multiple different things. Uh, for one, I'm more of a hands-on learner. So it's also about like the interaction that I get with my teachers at school. And I know that it's a lot on them because most of us don't have our cameras on during the day. And we try to interact with them, but I feel like our emotions and the way we're interacting also weighs down on them. So having my drama teacher, my English teachers, just seeing the way that they interact with us, no matter what the circumstance is, they help me. Um, something else is being surrounded by my peers and me being alone in my room, I'm like, you know what? I'm not doing this work. And it got to a point where my grades were bad, but now I'm more surrounded with peers. We're having like study days where we go to somebody's house, we eat food and we do work together and just making sure that, you know, we have each other, we have people to bounce off. You know, if somebody gets distracted, we get ourselves in order and just having someone that I feel like I can connect to instead of just being by myself the entire time. It really helps me get back on track. Thank you for that. We're going to go into our final remarks. And I'd like to uh, begin with Dr. Turner and, and kind of go kind of clockwise to Dr. Turner, Dr. Jackson, Councilor Nelson, um, Mr. Ford, Mr. Hernandez, Ms. Rodriguez, and Ms. Anderson. Um, and I'd like to, in your final remarks, to give a word of encouragement to our viewers, whether they be a teen or an adult that has listened to this program, that has taken in this conversation, and they wanna know how they can get through to the next day. Um, they may be suffering, they, they may not have told anybody what they're going through. This is your opportunity to speak directly to our viewers and give them a word of encouragement. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Turner, you first. Yes, thank you. Thank you all for, for being here, for inviting us here. Um, for, for sharing with us, for teaching us, and hopefully taking something back for yourselves. Um, I would love to just say in general um, to the audience and to you all here, it's, it's okay to not be okay during these times. I think that was something that we heard all of the participants share, like what was the realization? When was the time that you said, you know, this situation is completely unusual and I have to figure out um, within myself, I have to find that strength 
Um, but it, it's, it's being able to acknowledge, right, that, that things are not normal and it's okay to feel the way that you do. And it's okay to seek support around um, things that are challenging to you. So whether that support is a family member, a friend, a, um, a, a, hot, a crisis hotline, or a teacher, it's, it's being able to reach out for support when you need it. And knowing that your physical health is just as important as your mental health. And you don't have to be in a full-blown crisis to seek support. Thank you for that. Dr. Jackson. I'm, I hope um, what listeners have heard, especially from the vulnerability of our, of our team panel, is really also that you're not alone. Um, and I think that's something that you guys spoke so well to in terms of your connection with your friends. And you all have had different reactions, different ways of coping. Um, you have different outlooks on things, um, but it's so important to, for people to feel that you know, they're not alone. This is really unprecedented, as, as was said earlier. Um, and we all have to just go through what we're going through and seek help um, when we need it. Um, but I think the other part I, I wanted to just say about this panel is we need to continue these conversations as well. Um, you know, I think we are focused so much, again, on the physical health aspects of things and testing and the vaccine and things like that. But these conversations about mental health need to continue for us to be clear that this is this is normal. Pre-pandemic, one in five people had a mental health challenge. Um, during the pandemic, from research that we've seen so far, it's four in 10 adults, at least, are identifying needs. This, this is not uncommon, and we need to continue the conversation. Thank you for that. Councillor Nelson. Yes, I, I think what the students have really shown us, and I think this, this really goes to, speaks to the adults, is that it's okay to take your mask off. Um, I think as parents, a lot of times we do put a mask on of we, we always have to be on top of our game. We have to have all the correct answers at the right time. We need to be able to effectively lead our families and, and make all the right decisions. But I'm seeing, and what I've heard today is that uh, our kids are able to see right through that and they're able to see our places of weakness. And I think that we need to begin to embrace that and let them see that because it's, it's very easy to to put on a facade. We see that on social media all the time. It's very easy to create another persona and to operate in that way. It's very, very difficult and it takes a whole lot of courage to show your vulnerability. And I think that that is one key thing that all of us need to be uh, able to start looking at is how can, can I be okay with my child seeing that I may be a little bit fearful, I may not know what to do. Are they okay with knowing that and still feel as though I'm going to be a good parent to them? So I just want to encourage you to start having these conversations with your children and just sit back and listen. And it's okay if you don't have the answer, because the answer is actually a lot of times just listening. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councilor Nelson. And, and to be clear with our audience, he was talking about the proverbial mask. We want you to keep your mask on, <laughs> especially indoors. <laughs> um, <laughs> Mr. Ford. Um, your your final remarks, your encouragement to our audience. Uh, I think my final remarks for everyone probably be like, I would say it is what it is because my thing is you can never go back from the past. So I feel like just dealing with the situation there on, just moving from it, the best thing you could do because you just be stuck in the situation. The past is always going to be the past, but you can always move on from the future and start over. And no matter what it is, even a school assignment or saying motivation for gym or schoolwork or a career college, you always just start over the next day and just be like, all right, I messed up today. All right, I took an L, come back, took the W, and that it is what it is. It don't have to be more necessarily, all right, I need a schedule and everything because life is not a schedule. Our, everything is always in shambles. So it's just how you're dealing with it. I think that's the one part I had to take with this. I think, I don't think life get better, but I think you better way, you deal with life better. So I don't think it's like, Life, when people say, oh, life will get better or it'll get better sooner or later. I don't think that would is. I think you're learning how to cope with it and deal with it in your own personal way. So I think that's the key to everybody and just put less pressure on yourself and 
you you're supposed to make mistakes. That's the biggest thing. Always make mistakes and you just learn from them. And that's if you don't learn from something, that's probably the most important thing you need to do is learn from the mistakes. So always try to make mistakes so it benefit from you from later. Thank you for that, uh, Mr. Hernandez. So uh, my final remark would be just to surround yourself with people that um, love you and people that uh, that you want to be like. For example, like if you wanted uh, high grades or you know um, someone who's very diligent, uh, surround yourself with that type of people. Surround yourself with people from the National Honor Society, and those people will begin to influence you and help you go forward in how you want to present yourself, how you want to be, how you want to be in your future. So yeah, just surround yourself with people that you want to be like in the future. Ms. Rodriguez? It has been a roller coaster. And I'm sure everyone can relate to all the mental struggles, to all just the regular struggles that we've been through. But I know this is like a little cheesy, but like it does get better. Like it really does get better at the end of the day. And you just have to find something that's going to push you and motivate you even further. Thank you for that. And Ms. Anderson. Uh, for me, I just wanna say that don't be afraid to express yourself. Um, if you lose passion in something that you love forever, it's perfectly fine. You might get back into it later, but for now, just find something to keep yourself interested, distracted, and keep your hopes held high. We will get back to normal. It might not be soon, but it'll happen eventually, and we have a lot to look forward to in the future. And Dr. Dean, your final remarks. I want to thank everyone for, for speaking tonight. Young people, you're amazing. And you have shared so much. So continue to be encouraged, continue to, to find that way. And to the mental health professionals, thank you. Thank you for sharing. And we need to continue the conversation. For those that don't have anyone to speak to, rem remember, 1-888-222-2228. Uh, you can text or call. It's the second floor helpline. Anytime, day or night, you're not alone. You are not alone. I appreciate that. And I want to send a special thank you to the Scattergood Foundation and for viewers like you for making this conversation possible. Uh, and if you enjoyed this conversation and looking forward to more, you can always become a WHY member at why.org slash TV12, pledging any amount makes you a member uh, to our esteemed panelists of all ages. Your time has been greatly appreciated and not taken for granted. For WHY, I'm Chris Norris. Good night. <laughs>